Hello, everyone. A very good morning. Uh, we are waiting for a few more people as people are joining. Uh, we'll start in the next two minutes. I hope that is fine. Hello, everyone. We will wait for another one minute, I think, before we start. Uh, if you don't mind sitting on your camera, that would be great. We can uh, make it an interactive session. Also, feel free to use the chat uh, for any questions, for any comments. Also, if you want to quickly introduce yourself. And also, I wanted to know if you have attended the session one. That would be good information to uh, set some context here for this session. So yeah, please feel free to put in the chat if you have attended session one. So we are doing a four-part series. I'll give you more introduction on that. But yeah, so this is the session two. Um, let me quickly share my screen. Hi, Priyanka. Hi, Ramesh. Thanks for joining today. We'll wait one more minute before we start. Yes, yeah, so I was just saying, like, this is the session two on DeFi Days, the series that we are doing with DHub. Uh, we did a session last Wednesday. We'll be doing another one next week. So, yeah, if you were there for the last session, just say yes in the chat. That would give us more idea uh, if you have, like, the background on DeFi. If not, that's also just say no, that you are not there. Then also we can, like, give some more background on uh, what we are doing here. Cool. So it seems like we have like four or five people who attended the last session. We have a lot of new people today. So, okay, cool. I can maybe quickly give an introduction and uh, then we can jump into what we are going to talk about today. So I'm Karan Nambuwani. I'm leading the DYDX Foundation in India. Uh, if you are not familiar with DYDX, DYDX is one of the leading uh, perpetual decentralized exchange. And DYDX Foundation, we are there to support the protocol and build a community around it, participate in the, or facilitate governance. Uh, everything related to the ecosystem essentially at DYDX is something that the foundation is looking at. And I'm leading all the community efforts in India. Uh, we have collaborated on the series on DeFi with T Hub. Thanks for uh, the entire T Hub team for hosting us as well as uh, assembling all this, like, uh, great audience as well as uh, whatever we are trying to do here with spreading more education on DeFi. So thanks again for that. And uh, yeah, so today we are going to talk more about some of the DeFi applications. So last time we did a very quick introduction on uh, DeFi, a high level overview. Today we'll dig more deeper into some of the functional areas, some uh, technical things as well. But again, I'll try to keep it um, at a level so that it's easy to follow both for like beginners and intermediate. And if you have any questions, please use the chat functionality again. If you want to switch off your switch on your video, that would be great. It will give me uh, more like a feel of like interactive sort of session. But cool. Without waiting any further, let's dig into it. So we did like thanks for putting some thoughts on uh, what you are expecting from the session. So we did of course like the registration of. Uh, uh, this entire series and we got some uh, good feedback from all of you in terms of what you're expecting what you're uh, aiming to get out of all these sessions that we are doing so uh, these are some of the things i highlighted last week as well i'm just going to put one thing in bold today which is uh, going to be the focus for today's session so this is to understand more about define its applications uh, we're going to touch upon a few applications that are popular in decentralized finance and uh, uh, also dig a bit more deeper into how the technology is built, how the smart contracts are designed, what is the different functional aspect of like these different applications, right? So we are doing, of course, as I mentioned, a four part series, and this is the session two. The first one we did an intro. This one is more focused on applications. The next one I'm inviting a colleague to talk more about uh, DeFi governance and DAOs. So that's going to be an interesting session if you're interested in like how this new uh, organization structure of autonomous organizations work, how to participate more actively in uh, decentralized governance, all those aspects you can uh, definitely join the next session. And the last one we'll be doing in the second week of May around community and growth. So if you're an entrepreneur or uh, you are like building a product or you're working in the Web3 space and you want to grow your community further, you want to achieve more growth with your product, uh, that's something we'll be focusing in the last session. Cool. So before we start, yes, Bharat, uh, yes, we will record all the sessions and uh, I'll coordinate with the T-Hub team to 
uh, share whatever we can from the session uh, with the broader community. So before we start, uh, a quick disclaimer, of course, all that we are talking about here is purely for education purposes to uh, help you explain this new technology, the new paradigm that we are designing. Uh, none of it is financial advice. Don't consider any of uh, the products that we mentioned about today or any of these sessions uh, to be like endorsement of them or, uh, yeah, again, don't uh, consider the financial advice and do your own research before uh, venturing into the space. And a quick disclaimer here is, of course, like crypto products and NFTs are unregulated and can be highly risky. And there's no regulatory cause for any loss of, of from these transactions. So... Cool. Starting with a quick introduction on DeFi so that we set some context here. Of course, if you were there for the last session, uh, we talked a lot about like what DeFi is, how it evolved, what was the history behind it, how uh, like this entire space has gone from the early days of Bitcoin to this new complex technologies that are being built today. Uh, so DeFi essentially is a parallel financial system, you can say, which is built without the need for any central parties or central intermediaries. And uh, it is all open for anyone to participate. And of course, the users have full control of uh, their assets. So this is important. Uh, the last part is very important that uh, this is very different from a traditional finance or even a centralized finance in digital asset space that you as a user have full control. You uh, don't give your assets away to any custodian to manage and you have full visibility on how your assets are uh, interacting with all these systems, how they are being transferred across different applications and different systems. Um, so yeah, that's that's about DeFi and there are many different applications. Of course, decentralized finance, uh, sorry, decentralized exchange exchanges are uh, a big application. They are lending platforms, which are one of the oldest uh, applications in DeFi. Prediction markets are also very popular. Uh, again, they have been in this space for many years and some new ideas like liquidity, yield farming uh, came about more with uh, the DeFi boom, which we saw since 2020, uh, what we call as DeFi summer. There were some new ideas that came up and uh, we will talk about some of these today. Uh, but yeah, that's that's uh, how this entire like uh, technology is being built or what are the different use cases or technologies that is being utilized in. So we did look at this in the last session as well, that there are all these applications of uh, lending and borrowing, tokenization, um, stable coins, asset management, different products, different uh, uh, applications being built in this DeFi space. We are not going to talk about every, each and every of them. Uh, but of course, if you have some questions, we'll take that. But uh, we are going to take some key applications that I think are very interesting or uh, which are kind of the building blocks where everything is started from. And uh, we looked at this as well, that there are in DeFi now, most of the centralized applications, traditional financial applications like central banking, money, investment exchanges, brokerages have some sort of uh, analogous technology in DeFi. Uh, and most of these use cases are being built on a blockchain, built in a decentralized manner in DeFi space. Of course, it's not 100% uh, apples to apples when you compare traditional finance or these applications, because as you understand, it's a totally new technology. It's a totally new way of uh, functioning. So uh, what is being built is similar in a way. They are doing the similar sort of functionality, similar sort of uh, applications, but they are designed in a different manner or they're handled in a different manner. And of course, they're with, with more regulatory clarity, with more uh, usage, more retail users coming in. I think uh, these are going to serve more and more traditional financial purposes as well, but it's yet to achieve that sort of scale right now. But yeah, so this gives you a good um, overview in what we are going to talk about. Let me uh, share some latest research or some latest uh, insights on how the space is like growing or evolving. So the market cap or what you say, the total, uh, yeah, total uh, ecosystem of DeFi has been growing since, uh, especially since last three years, of course, it was started early on, let's say with the advent of Ethereum or um, the smart contract technology that started or the ICO boom that came in 2017. That's where a lot of tech, uh, these DeFi applications started coming uh, into picture, but it, 
started taking some critical mass or uh, growing their asset base more in the last two or three years. So this is status from a recent report that was published on CoinGecko. This gives comparison from last year. So in the just last one year, DeFi space has grown by uh, almost 65%. And uh, some of the biggest, of course, applications are in decentralized exchanges. Uh, lending, as I mentioned, lending and borrowing has been uh, one of the early applications that has uh, grown in DeFi, but also insurance derivatives are uh, some important applications that we'll talk about today. And there are some new interesting applications like liquid liquid staking. We are not going to touch upon this a lot because uh, that's more advanced for DeFi, but we can talk about it a bit if you want. And oracles are, of course, uh, what are used for uh, getting data from the outside world to blockchain. So that's another big area for DeFi. So there are some like smaller applications as well uh, that we can uh, touch upon a bit, but not necessarily go in depth on it. We won't be looking at any applications uh, that are actually being built on it. But yeah, so to start, first of all, uh, this is something that actually in the last session we were getting some questions on stable coins. So I thought maybe picking this up and I put it like as a starting uh, section for the presentation. So uh, stable coins kind of form the uh, backbone for a lot of uh, DeFi applications. Not necessarily, I, I should be calling it an, an application itself. It's more of uh, uh, an asset which is available in the ecosystem rather than an application of itself. But of course, you can uh, you can have a different opinion on it. You can say that it has its own application. But we'll start with the uh, stable coins to set some context. There are different kinds of stable coins. And uh, of course, we were getting some questions last week. So I thought of like uh, including this. There are fiat pegged or uh, fiat backed stable coins, which are essentially uh, one to one pegged with, let's say, US dollar or euro. And uh, they are also, there are like uh, ways of backing them with fiat currencies as well. They are uh, commodity pegged and commodity backed stable coin as well, uh, which are, let's say, uh, stable coins for uh, uh, a gold derivative or let's say silver derivative, something like that. Um, there are cryptocurrency pegged and cryptocurrency backed stable coins. So they are more like stable coins designed in a way that in, uh, in their reserve, they have uh, some blue chip cryptocurrencies for backing it. And then there are more uh, ELGO based stable coins. Uh, there are many interesting applications, many interesting products that have emerged in the last few years on Elgo stable coins, a lot of them have not been super successful. And uh, I'm sure if you have been following the space, you might have heard about some of them, but uh, I'll give you still a sense of what these are. So, so just to define like these stable coins, of course, the first fiat backed stable coins are, uh, let's say backed by a traditional currency, uh, let's say US dollar or uh, Euro and held in a bank account. And the stable coin issuers uh, peg those those stable coins, the value of those stable coins with that reserve currency. I think it's straightforward. You might have uh, heard about USDT, USDC. Some of these are like uh, majorly backed by uh, state, uh, sorry, fiat reserves. Then there are crypto backed stable coins. Let's say, uh, for example, Dai, which was one of the earliest stable coins, is launched by uh, MakerDAO, which. Uh, kind of is a pioneer in the space uh, for DeFi and MakerDAO uh, essentially started the idea of this uh, reserve stable coin even before Ethereum smart contracts were like fully developed and used. Uh, thanks for all the applause, Priyanka. I guess, uh, yeah, we can move on on uh, yeah, the slide, back to slide, thank you. So on uh, the crypto backed stable coins like DAI, there is, let's say, Ethereum, Bitcoin, or even some other stable coins like uh, USDC, which are in the reserve, which are giving the peg to the, uh, to the currency. So uh, that's like a second important type of stable coin. Third is uh, Elgo stable coins, algorithmic stable coins. They are kind of designed, they are very new to uh, the blockchain world or they are new in this DeFi space because there are interesting automated mechanisms based on which they uh, achieve their stability. So they usually use an algorithm to adjust like demand and supply of these stable coins, which kind of 
keep them balanced at a particular price level. It's usually very hard to achieve this, especially in a volatile market uh, where some of the algorithms might not perform in, let's say, uh, when the market is very volatile or there is a, a, a event that happens because of which the value fluctuates a lot. So uh, these are interesting use cases. A lot of teams are currently building uh, successfully running algo stable coins, but we are yet to see uh, uh, widespread sort of uh, use of them in the market. Then there are commodity brag stable coins, which can be usually uh, pegged to, let's say, uh, gold or silver value or any other like, commodity for that matter. And they have uh, evolved with uh, these, uh, these uh, assets or uh, a derivative or a contract of these assets, which are backing these stable coins. So there are many examples of that as well. So I think this is one of the primary applications of DeFi and it sets the uh, tone for a lot of things that we are going to talk about in the session about like other applications. Cool. So the second uh, app, which is uh, kind of early in the ecosystem, which gives um, very important foundation for DeFi is lending and borrowing. And I think it's very similar to traditional finance as well, which where lending, borrowing, loans uh, play a major role in functioning of financial institutions and functioning of uh, uh, the financial markets as well. So lending and borrowing uh, in DeFi works in an interesting manner. So there are two different parties. There are, of course, like borrowers and there are lenders. And there is a platform or a protocol or a smart contract that essentially manages the interaction between the borrowing and lending. So if you look from the borrower's viewpoint, it's uh, they will be depositing some sort of collateral and will be obtaining a uh, digital asset loan in return for that. And as soon as they pay the loan with the interest, they can withdraw their collateral back. They are usually in DeFi, they are over collateralized just because uh, because uh, a, a lot of DeFi applications, the user identities are not known. They are mostly like wallets that are interacting. So having like an over collateralized sort of system makes more sense rather than let's say a credit score or based on identity that uh, uh, would make sure that the users are uh, working in good faith. They are returning back the assets that they have borrowed. On the other side, of course, there's a lender which just deposits and uh, it deposits a particular assets and earns a uh, passive income or interest out of uh, their deposits. So they are essentially playing the role of providing liquidity. Borrowers are the one that are actually utilizing uh, what they are borrowing. They could be utilizing it in a different manner. So how this is different than, let's say, selling your assets is essentially you're just like putting a collateral. I don't want to sell a particular assets. I just want some other asset in return, which I want to utilize in other places and other applications. So that's what crypto uh, loans or crypto lending and borrowing is essentially used for. Um, there's a step-by-step -step sort of uh, functionality, how these contracts or how these uh, uh, applications are running. So I already mentioned some of this, but maybe I can uh, dig more deeper and share more context on some of these. So a user deposits a digital asset into a protocol to earn interest, usually called as lending. The, the protocol kind of can, creates a pool of uh, all these assets that are being lent and that can be uh, used by giving some loans to the borrowers. This is called as borrowing. Uh, a user can borrow assets by putting a collateral in form of another asset. I think we touched upon this already. And this collateral is currently being, or when let's say a borrower or a lender interacts with the contract, the collateral is held in the smart contract. So uh, essentially until the loan is paid, the smart contract uh, holds those custody of that access. And it's the smart contracts is an automated, it's not like a trusted party, which is custodying your assets. You have full visibility on how you have interacted with the blockchain. So uh, essentially there is, nothing nefarious that can be happening in the background with uh, custodying by a smart contract. Of course, it should be a, a, a well-established smart contract, but uh, that's the idea there. One interesting example, how this is this has performed better than conventional lending and borrowing in the digital asset market is when last year there were a lot of issues that happened with some centralized lenders like Celsius, Voyager, other people. Um, 
a lot of institutions that borrowed like multi million dollars of uh, loans they essentially had to pay back the defi contracts for, before even paying back uh, some of these lender cent- centralized lending platforms because these automated contracts are going to liquidate or are going to sell your assets uh, no matter what because the maths has been defined they are the kind of designed in a way uh, to make sure you follow this uh, uh, mechanism unlike let's say an opaque centralized system which is depending on a lot of different factors you don't know whether the assets are there you you will be depending on some external intervention some regulation some compliance body to come in uh uh get your assets or like help you facilitate any of those transactions right so they have performed actually much better in those scenarios as compared to traditional centralized sort of uh, uh, lending and borrowing products and of course i think we talked about this how uh, and not the entire system is managed by a smart contract so that smart contract essentially calculates uh, how much collateral it would like you to put for let's say next amount of loan and as i mentioned uh, it's usually over collateralized because uh, let's say let's say i want to borrow uh, 50 usdc i would be giving um, a collateral worth of uh let's say 100 dollars of ethereum for borrowing 50 usdc why that is is because uh, ethereum could be volatile it could be move up and down in value but uh, the underlying loan would be kind of secured till the point that uh, the base asset that you're lending doesn't fall below that value if it falls below that value the smart contract would automatically uh dilute or i uh, automatically liquidate you in that sense so that's the idea behind it and uh also the interest rate is calculated for these assets based on uh how much demand or supply is for a particular asset in the market let's say the liquidity pool wants more of a particular asset or would be giving a higher interest or higher yield for that uh, so that it can like facilitate like getting more uh, of those assets so that's how it's designed or we can take some questions on it if it's not 100% clear but that's like one of the primary or one of the most important applications in the defi space cool i'll take a quick pause and go through the question um is the holding protocol able to utilize collateralizes for loan uh the lending protocol usually uh has smart contracts that hold your assets in a pool they don't utilize it for any other activities it could be different applications working in a different manner but a lot of these applications are designed open source so you can kind of read their documents read the code and try to understand how they are utilizing your assets but usually it's just like smart contract holding your assets not doing anything with it uh they are just like bought it's a simple uh two way sort of a street where you are depositing that is being stored which is like lent to other parties uh once the call completes could share across the speedpd yes for sure we can share it across later on so this is a simple interface that i have put a screenshot of aave which is a popular lending and borrowing platform there are more like compound aave others that you can take a look at so this is how it looks like you essentially let's say you have x amount of particular asset in your wallet uh you can supply it to this lending pool which gives you a fixed interest of sorts uh at the time that you're depositing this interest is uh defined by how much of demand there is for that particular asset in the pool or in the market and when you have supplied your asset you can also borrow so in uh in this case let's say you want to borrow some stable coin these are all stable coins against uh lending ethereum so this would give you uh some sort of like apy for how much is the interest you would have to pay and essentially you can borrow against the collateral that you have provided so it's a simple interface for lending and borrowing no like complex paperwork no complex like uh, evaluation that goes behind it it's simple like you deposit your assets you get a loan for that collateral so yeah that was one of the primary applications the second one uh, is an amm exchange i uh, think this is one of the coolest or like most interesting innovation that came out of uh, uh, defi so this is a very simple sort of exchange of asset a to asset b let me share more information on it but before that i think uh i would like to describe a decentralized exchange so 
an AMM exchange is essentially a decentralized exchange. AMM stands for, by the way, automated market maker. And what is a decentralized exchange is it's kind of a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace where users can uh, trade or uh, essentially swap one asset for another without any center, central intermediaries. Again, like there's no central party. It's essentially just managed by smart contracts where you are, let's say, selling asset A and buying asset B. So an AMM is allowing that in a very interesting manner. Uh, and this we actually touched, touched upon in the last presentation as well, that uh, the DEX market share has been continuously increasing since the last two, three years. Uh, since 2020, we have seen almost like close to this year, we are seeing like 15 to 20% of entire market share of uh, uh, the trading, spot trading of digital assets on decentralized exchanges. And it's bound to grow in the coming years as well as the technology becomes more mature as uh, people become more comfortable interacting with these platforms as uh, there's more security and assurances uh, from all this technology. So it's bound to grow more. So that's why we are still in our D phase. It's still like 15, 20% of the people or percentage of uh, users are essentially using it. Uh, but yeah, that's bound to grow. So coming back to like the topic about AMMs, we are talking about automated market makers. So uh, you might have heard about some of them, Uniswap, PancakeSwap, uh, SushiSwap. They are all popular products out there. And what's interesting is it's very simple, a mechanism, but it kind of ensures everything happens in a decentralized manner. Everything happens in a non-custodial uh, sort of way. And uh, how this is done is, again, there are two different parties in uh, which are interacting or two different kinds of users that are interacting. So there are liquidity providers and then there are traders who are essentially there to trade the assets. So liquidity providers, what they do is, let's say you want to trade uh, asset A and asset B and there is a person who is a liquidity provider who has both assets A and asset B. What they would be doing is they would be depositing asset A plus asset B in a particular pool, which is called like the trading pool for that particular asset. And they would be depositing in that proportion, which is kind of the price of that asset. So let's say they would be depositing 10 token A and one token B. So what you can think of it as like one token B is equivalent to almost 10 token A. So they would be depositing in a liquidity pool and that liquidity pool essentially stores uh, these assets A and B by many different uh, liquidity providers. There could be like multiple entities who are submitting uh, liquidity to this pool. And it's in return for these providing this liquidity, they kind of get a share of uh, a token, which is kind of representing the share of the pool. So let's say 10% of the assets are being deposited by liquidity provider A, they would be getting like 10% of the shares of the pool. Then on the other hand, if there's a trader who wants to uh, trade between asset A and asset B, so let's say they want to sell their asset A and uh, get asset B in return, they would simply be, uh, coming and depositing asset A to this pool and, and the pool would automatically be giving them uh, the equivalent amount of asset B and would be charging uh, X amount of fee for this. So uh, why this is unique is it's a very simple sort of formula I'll show you in the next slide. But uh, in, in, in the previous, in, in the uh, old world, it used to be uh, like complex order books that used to manage like selling between uh, peer to peer between different parties. Uh, somebody would be pl placing a sell order, somebody would be placing a buy order, and that's when the transactions will get executed at a particular price. Uh, in this case, it's very different that you are directly interacting with the pool and the price is uh, directly defined by the pool itself. You don't need to have any other party on the other side. You are simply going to trade your assets directly with the pool having the assets over there. You can create many different pools. You can create many different, uh, uh, like these swapping pairs. Even there are pools which have like more than one pair. So it could have like multiple uh, different assets within it, which you can interact with. You can sell A for B and C, something like that. So this is how an AMM works. And uh, just to walk you through the steps again, so that uh, there is more clarity on what we are saying here. Uh, the user deposits, let's say uh, two different tokens in the liquidity pool that we saw, a smart contract automatically de determines the initial exchange rate, which would be like the ratio in which you deposit the pool uh, in the pool. Uh, and the user who wants to trade one asset for another uh, 
is going to use directly the pool to interact with. And the, the maths formula that I mentioned about is a constant product function. It's a very simple sort of uh, function, which is X into Y is equal to a constant K. So X is the price of token A, Y is price of token B, and uh, K is kind of a constant at the initial set ratio. So let's say there is more Y in the pool, the asset X value will decrease. So let's say there's more and more Ethereum in the pool and you are changing it with USDC. So they, uh, this essentially means that uh, uh, there is less demand for ETH and the price of ETH will kind of continuously keep going down as uh, compared to uh, USDC. So that's a constant function that it maintains. And uh, also liquidity providers earn the fee that you pay for any uh, exchange. And uh, also the users can anytime remove liquidity from the pool. So let me show you the interface, how it looks like, and we can take some questions uh, at the end of the section. So this is a very simple swap interface, how it looks like on Uniswap. Uh, you can see over on the top, like swap, swap or trade functionality, there's pool, board charts, and the different things for uh, analytics and governance. But uh, here you can see, let's say you have ETH, you want to trade it for DAI, you can simply put like one ETH and it will give you X amount of DAI and you can swap it, connect your wallet and swap it. So this is essentially interacting with the pool in the background, which is ETH and DAI pool. And if you are a liquidity provider, uh, this is how the interface looks for you. So you have, let's say ETH and DAI, both the things you want to provide liquidity to, those, to this particular pool. And here, this blue section you see is essentially the liquidity in that pool. And uh, it's providing liquidity at a particular price, which is, let's say, around $1,800, $1,900 at this point. Uh, and yeah, you'll be submitting, let's say, I'm providing liquidity of these tokens at this particular price. So this is Uniswap V3. If you want to learn more about it, this is kind of concentrated liquidity, what we call. So you have these two uh, constant uh, price ranges in between which you are providing liquidity. So let's say you have X amount of assets, you want this to be distributed between only this price range. Uh, this is a new innovation by Uniswap in the latest version. In the first version of Uniswap, you can only use uh, Ethereum as the trading pair. So if you are, let's say, trading between uh, USDT and USDC, you would be first trading with Ethereum and then trading Ethereum back to USDT. So uh, that was the first version. Second version of Uniswap was more about uh, you... Yeah, so we were on this aspect that, uh, okay, you can provide liquidity and there were like different versions of Uniswap which uh, allow you different things. So second version kind of allows you uh, to trade any pair with any pair. And this actually opened the uh, space entirely because you can kind of create any market between two assets. You can trade them, just create a pool and start trading like any kind of asset A to asset B because of which a lot of scam tokens also came up, but uh, this kind of improves uh, liquidity or uh, the markets that are available for trading uh, at a larger scale. And uh, the third version is about concentrated liquidity. So you can provide in a particular range. So let's say the asset is trading at let's $1,800. You can still provide uh, your liquidity in a very narrow range of let's say $4,000. And when the market one day becomes very volatile and the price touches 4,000, people will just be utilizing liquidity from what you have provided. So you'll be making most uh, fee. So this uh, new version uh, actually was licensed for two years, but recently expired on 1st of April. Now we will see like more products coming up with this idea of concentrated liquidity. Uh, and uh, with DeFi, it's very interesting that most of these products are open source. You have the technology code available uh, to learn, read, and also just like simply fork and create your own product out of it. So now that uh, the license expired, you can essentially, uh, if you if you want, or if there's any other product that kind of wants to replicate this model, they can pick that open source code and uh, start building on it. But yeah, you have to like learn more and dig more deeper into how you can utilize or how the licensing essentially works for a particular protocol. Um, so yeah, that's the idea of AMMs, which is one of the most interesting ones that I see uh, in the space. And if you have any questions, I can take them at this point. Uh, how the pricing of the conversion rate is derived and how the token value is paid in sync with centralized exchanges. Yeah, so uh, in a traditional world, when there is an order book, there's usually 
oracles we saw like oracles play a major role in defi oracles essentially are products that uh, get the price of an asset from an external world to your particular product so let's say uh, you are uh, running our own exchange and you want to get the price of a particular asset you will be getting some oracle prices from binance from uh, coin dcx from other like centralized exchanges a bunch of different centralized exchanges to kind of get an average price of uh, what the asset price is so that's the role of oracles that's how it works in a conventional manner but in an amm as you see it all depends on this pool it is not connected to any external oracle any external world so the the price is being defined by demand and supply and how it ensures it's close to market value is by these uh, uh, these users who are called kind of arbitrages or who utilize this opportunity which is called an arbitrage so let's say you see a particular asset being traded at a less price on binance as compared to uniswap what you can do is you can buy it on binance and sell it on uniswap right so slowly that kind of balances the pool and this arbitrage opportunity initially at that few seconds when you see that price difference uh, somebody utilizes that to essentially make money out of it but that's what arbitrages do and that's how the price value is maintained if that answers your question so yeah there's no like oracle external value it's just like simple demand and supply if you see higher value in the market you buy it there you sell it here essentially just brings down the price cool the third uh, application is uh, perpetuals and i'll talk a bit about it uh, as of course i have most experience on this side dydx is a perpetuals derivatives exchange you might have uh, seen in that graph that derivatives play a major role in defi they have a lot of liquidity and assets in defi as well so what perpetuals are are also a new innovation uh, in this digital assets space it's similar to futures contract if you are used to conventional uh, trading uh, futures contracts are essentially a uh, contract for buying or selling a particular asset at a particular uh, price at a particular time so that's kind of a contract that you sign with uh, extra like let's say another person that you would be buying this asset at that particular price at that particular time that's a futures contract perpetuals are essentially just futures contract without an expiry date so they don't have like a defined time at which you will be selling it's more like let's say uh, uh, if you let's say you just like continuously will be renewing the contract uh, for any position that you hold so just to explain it in a more easier way what futures contracts are uh, let's say i am a farmer i grow apples in my field um, they are selling for 50 rupees a kg i am selling it to a wholesaler in the market who is buying it at 50 rupees a kg today i have the fear that uh, there is another farmer who is starting growing apples in in the nearby field there's another farmer who is grow started growing apples in the nearby state there are like more and more people coming up with apple farm so i feel that six months down the line uh, the price of apples will go down because there would be a lot of production happening so what i would do is i will go to the wholesale i'll tell them you know what you are buying the apples for 50 rupees a kg today could you sign a contract with me to buy them at 50 rupees six months down the line as well so i'm kind of uh, signing the contract i'm holding a short position which means that i think the value of apples will go down in value six months down the line the wholesaler on the other hand uh, thinks that the weather might not be uh, favorable in the next few months for apples he thinks that uh, the apple prices are actually going to go up the demand is going to come down like there won't be so much production it could be trading at 70 rupees a kg so the wholesaler would see this is as a good deal they will see okay actually why not i sign this contract at 50 rupees six months down the line this farmer is going to sell me for 50 rupees no matter what so they are essentially longing uh, what we call as longing in uh, trading so uh, there is the farmer who is holding a short position they think the prices are going to go down there is a wholesaler who is longing and holding a long position uh, who thinks that the prices are going to go up so this is a futures contract that is signed six months down the line and uh, uh, that's how essentially futures work they are kind of derivatives you are not signing or buying apples directly you are not buying that asset directly you are just uh, trading on the notional value of those assets 
and these futures contract can actually be traded in the market as well let's say a farmer i sign this contract i can sell this contract to an external party saying that you know what this is a contract you can uh, sell these apples for 50 rupees and they're selling it to you there's a free deal with this wholesaler that wholesaler can be able to sell that contract as well and people actually start trading on that contract itself they are not even trading on the apple they're just simply trading on the notional value of that asset underlying asset right so that's what uh, uh, derivatives of futures contracts are and perpetuals is exactly this kind of a contract but without an expiry date there's no deadline it's just essentially like uh, trading an asset at a particular uh, notional value just long and shorting it and uh, decentralized perpetuals essentially are uh, again like non custodial and you are trading based on uh, the prices and here i think to your question previously kasi uh, there is oracles that play a role in defining what is the external price of that asset at at any given point so perpetuals was a concept def- designed or developed uh, by bitmax a few years ago i think it was 2015 that they came up with this idea and why it is easy on a decentralized or a blockchain technology is because these contracts can be defined in an automated manner and the entire thing get, just keeps perpetually going on without any expiry or selling or closing the position so that's what perpetuals are and decent uh, dydx is one of the leading the biggest uh, decentralized perpetual exchange out there the interface looks very uh, similar to a conventional or a centralized exchange that you might be familiar with buying and selling is essentially longing and shorting a particular assets and there is this order book and there is like the price graph for a particular asset so here you are essentially trading on the notional value of matic token if you are doing that uh, just an example but uh, that you are always in uh, the base pair as usdc or some stable coin uh, you are not essentially buying that asset you are not spot trading you are just like uh, trading that derivative uh, and how they work functionally on a smart contract level is uh, currently for dydx i'm taking an example it is built on starkware layer 2 layer 2 is uh, sorry layer 2 is a, uh, a scalable uh, blockchain technology so essentially it is built on ethereum layer 2 of ethereum you can call ethereum as layer 1 uh, blockchain layer 2 is built on top which uh, carries on more transactions and confirms them on the layer 1 so just like so that is faster more scalable so it's currently built on ethereum layer 2 where you deposit your assets from let's say ethereum to this layer 2 you will be bridging your assets across to uh, this new network and the smart contracts are being run on layer 2 so they are running on the starkware which ensure all the trading that happens currently trading happens off chain it doesn't happen on chain but uh, with the new version that dydx is working on in the next 6 months you will see a new chain launching which is built on cosmos which would be having the entire order book the entire trading happening on the blockchain itself like in a decentralized manner so that's what dydx is currently building that's a topic another interesting topic of course if you have more questions on that i can pick it but uh, that's something that uh, that dydx is building for the long term essentially in the idea is like 5 uh, years 10 years down a lot of uh, trades lot of transactions would be happening in a decentralized manner Uh, so like building the entire protocol for this particular use case holds a lot of value so uh, that's how it works like currently currently in the version 3 of dydx uh, it's uh, depositing on the layer 2 and like smart contracts are running on layer 2 and users can of course withdraw their funds close their positions at any time it currently works in a non custodial manner uh, uh, there's no central party that holds your assets in any way cool so that's about perpetual contract i can probably take a question or two uh, can we use it in enterprise ethereum between wallet to wallet transaction as smart contracts where as entry and exit of currency into wallets will be backed by regulated currency uh, yeah that's a that's a that's a slightly different topic like that's not purely defi i would say but of course there are some enterprise uh, technologies or what you call as private blockchains which uh, allow you to create like uh, a currency or a wallet in that particular ecosystem so it's not trustless it's not like fully distributed or anyone can participate in that blockchain it's essentially a set of trusted parties that come together build a private blockchain and that kind of is used for a particular use case so of course you can do it uh, is the question if the question is like how it would interact with the external 
public blockchain there could be like bridges there could be ways how like these assets are being transferred between those two networks it all depends on how the private blockchain wants to design it public blockchains are essentially like open and you can already see how it would be designed how it would be bridged but it all depends on how that private blockchain is designed uh is there a dvdx feed that distributes the depth of the book uh that's something i can check there are apis available you can check uh, the api documents i can probably send a link later or if uh vivan if you are there from my team you can probably link the api documents for dvdx for kasi to uh take a look at what is publicly available cool interoperability required between protocol exactly so that's another major area that is currently we'll talk about it in the last slide about like the road ahead cool so last application that i wanted to touch upon this is interesting and unique one it's not uh, very popular yet but it holds a lot of value is around like defi insurance so just a example that i have taken here uh, is of nexus mutual so as you can understand there are still many uh many like challenges or issues you can say with uh, defi technology that's still new uh, there are security vulnerabilities some of the tech is being like developed on an ongoing basis so as you can see the systems are being uh, changed in production so there are like uh, chances of vulnerability there are chances of uh, ways in which this could be exploited so there is a huge need of insurance and uh, that kind of defi applications are there which um, are available to make sure your assets are insured or successful uh, success, successfully backed in a way so one of the products available is nexus mutual and how this is designed is uh, a current insurance model would look something like this there would be a, a central entity that would be uh, selling you the insurance developing the product underwriting processing any claims that you make for insurance uh, they would be managing your investments let's say you are buying insurance all the money that is coming in by different parties who are buying this insurance would be managed by an investment arm which would probably be managed by a central party as well so it's a very centralized sort of structure <coughs> uh managing all these aspects in a decentralized world it would be kind of a split in like different decentralized uh communities or members or ways or smart contracts which would be like doing the same things but in a more distributed manner so this is was the initial nexus mutual structure of course things have changed i took this from their white paper and uh, this was a few years ago so it has changed evolved a bit but just to give you like a sense of how the functionality works is uh, there is this base protocol or kind of the main uh, contract that essentially you interact with uh, to buy or sell insurance that is managing the investments as well in an automated manner in the background but then other functionalities like uh, risk assessment like assessing whether a particular protocol uh, should be part of this insurance product or not uh, how risky a particular protocol is for sure whether we should be providing services for a particular contract or not is being assessed by a different party whether uh, whenever somebody makes a claim that i my assets got hacked uh, there would be like a separate uh, commune of people information whether a product was exploited or not the person whoever is like let's say somebody saying x uh, protocol was exploited they would be going and checking whether it was exploited that particular address uh, was impacted by that exploit or not so there would be like a different set of people uh, designing or defining this claim process uh, then the governance uh, of this entire product would be done by a separate or individual sort of token holders in that way so all this is kind of distributed and this is built for uh, defi protocols at the very start to make sure like the assets are insured uh, but later on it can be expanded to other uh, real world sort of use cases it all depends on how successfully uh, this can scale and how effectively like the decision making can happen in a decentralized manner but that's how it's defined and again let me uh, quickly walk you through the steps of how a user interacts on a functional level so a user can deposit x amount of tokens uh, into the uh, nexus mutual smart contract to become a member of the mutual so essentially they are depositing to become uh, part of uh, this uh, entire network and uh, the members of the mutual can 
propose that a particular, let's say I want to propose that, okay, Uniswap, Uniswaps on smart contracts should be one of the smart contracts that is insured by Nexus Mutual because it has been running for many years. It's kind of successful. It's uh, uh, so far secure in a manner. So the uh, mutual members can propose a particular contract, propose a particular technology that they think uh, should be part of this uh, mechanism. And uh, yeah, that goes through a governance process. And let's say there's a vulnerability found in your smart, smart contract and there's an exploit and that user or any part, any users from that mutual get impacted by it, they can kind of claim uh, this uh, exploit from uh, the other assets that are available in the network. So that's how it works in a decentralized manner at a very high level. I'm just being cognizant of time. We have five more minutes, so I'm quickly going through uh, this. So yes, yeah, so coming to the last section, which is about like, okay, there are many challenges and what is the road ahead for uh, DeFi, even though we see that there are all these applications that are available, but there are some things like, of course, smart contract security is a major aspect, which kind of hinders a lot of people from interacting with these products. They think they are not secure. They are not, uh, they can be easily exploited. They have heard a lot of hacks or news about it. So that's one of the challenge, of course, that is being currently handled but as I mentioned, it's a new space. It's a young technology. It uh, uh, takes time to make it very robust. Then cross-chain composability. I think, Ramesh, uh, you mentioned that point about interoperability between protocols. So there are many different blockchains, Ethereum, Polygon, Solana, uh, Avalanche. Like There would be like hundreds of different blockchains that are building, growing their ecosystems, have DeFi products on top. Uh, but the interoperability between them, let's say I want to process a loan or process a particular transaction from one network to another network is still not 100% uh, there yet. So it takes some time for this composability to be built. The, there is a lot of, uh, we have seen like this multi-chain sort of world evolving uh, where there are bridges between all these blockchain networks that transfer assets, transfer messages between these uh, protocols. Uh, they are still not 100% safe. We have seen quite a few exploits on the bridging level because they're kind of custodying the assets in a in a contract on in some manner, which can be exploited as well. So that's something uh, that is currently being worked on. A lot of products are being built. So as a, as a member in the ecosystem, as somebody who wants to contribute, there are some of these things you can continuously look at. Also, the user base is quite small as compared to some traditional financial application where there would be millions or maybe even like, let's say, billion users in a particular product, let's say Visa, MasterCard, or uh, UPI for that matter. Uh, DeFi is still very small. There would be, let's say, uh, less than less than a billion or maybe 500k users that are interacting on a regular basis or active on a monthly basis. So it's still very small. Very few people are in this space, but as it becomes more secure, as it becomes more easier to use, it will uh, involve more and more people coming into the ecosystem. And the user experience, as I mentioned, is slightly complex. Uh, there are new ways of doing things and they're not necessarily uh, enough information available or enough like help available to interact with these products. So as the user experience becomes more simple, as the applications are designed, that they have like a high utility for the user. They can simply uh, do something in an easy manner. I think uh, some of these issues would be resolved as well. So, uh, so yeah, that's that. Those are some of the challenges and some of the interesting things to continuously work toward, build on. Of course, all we are trying to do here is helping you is to uh, educate and spread the word how this is used, and also provide support in case you want any. Uh, uh, if, if you want to like interact or if you want to participate more, how you can come forward and of course like interact with our community to learn more. I talked about this a bit in the last session as well, how to get involved. You can join different DeFi communities to learn more. You can learn, uh, let's say different programming languages. If you want to find a job, you can even like take some non-tech roles, let's say marketing, community, business development, all those are available for in different protocols, even like roles around governance, DAOs, there are many different opportunities available that you can apply for, interact with if you want to like get involved in the Web3 DeFi space. Uh, you can actively participate in forums and governance. Once you start becoming or following a particular protocol, 
uh, you become more familiar how things are moving. You become more familiar with how these new things are coming up, and especially like now that we are seeing a big boom of AI, machine, machine learning, machine to machine sort of economy. This is going to play more of a major role because all these uh, machines are sort of going to live in a digital world, interact with digital technologies in a way. So this is going to become more and more massive. So the more you get involved and try to understand how it works today, it would help in the longer term. Uh, try some of the applications on testnet uh, join our community try to ask questions and of course you can follow some uh, good insightful members from the community on different forums like twitter youtube to learn more and just be like more open and curious and trying to learn about uh, defi overall a uh, couple of other links that i wanted to share so there's something called as dydx academy that you can check out it provides a lot of resources on how to increase your knowledge and also uh, how you can learn more about different technologies. Uh, you can apply for different grants. So we have something called a new grant on DYDX, which is a uh, community uh, quadrant, which allows you to apply for a small grant for any research or work that you want to do. So uh, that's also open now. You can check out our grants website. Yeah, that's, that's uh, it. You can join our community. I've put a QR code there for our Telegram community. You can join come say hi if you have any questions if you're learning anything new of course we'd be happy to help and i can probably take one or two last questions that we have so quick catch question on off-chain oracle computation when building DeFi derivatives protocol which involves several technical complexities the latency in oracle networks and all the key technical challenges to finalize transaction i think yeah that's a good point uh, oracles are also have been impacted in different ways in the last few few years. Of course, there are many successful Oracle solutions out there, uh, both centralized and decentralized that provide high quality data, but they have been inc incidents where they have been impacted. There's latency to provide the right sort of data, which kind of impacts the users on the application who are trying to trade at a particular price and the Oracle data is trickling in at a slower rate. So yeah, I think that's a good comment there, uh, but we see like more decentralized Oracles coming in. Uh, DYDX protocol is also designing a new mechanism. Uh, you can check out a recent tweet by Antonio, who's the founder of DYDX, around how they are looking at uh, designing the new Oracle solution for the new protocol that we are building. So there are many different ways uh, of solving this. Uh, how about CBDC and DeFi? So CBDC is an interesting topic because every country is trying to learn, experiment, build their own solutions. Uh, at the end of the day, it's most of these technologies are market driven. So if there are users uh, picking it up, of course, technology plays an important role. Technology can be built right or wrong, good or bad. Uh, it can be built in the right kind of efficient manner. And we have seen many successful technologies by uh, public enterprises in India, like uh, UPI, and which have been very successful, very well implemented. So it all depends on like how USD, sorry, CBDCs are built, how they are kind of brought to the market, how well they are adopted by the users, how well they interact with external protocols, external uh, uh, products out there, whether they'll be interacting with public blockchains or not, whether they'll be part of the DeFi or not. So I think that's something to uh, see in the coming years, but too early to comment on that right now. Uh, yeah, that's thanks for putting the link there, Vivan, for our telegram chat you can come join there uh, are there any opportunities if there's anything interesting of course you can join our communities we regularly post about it uh, and uh, can we work from Hyderabad I think we are hosting an event at Hyderabad with T Hub uh, second week of May on 10th of May so would love to meet all of you there if you are in Hyderabad so yeah we are hosting an evening session and uh, DYDX foundation uh, some of the key personals are coming down for that event. So more information on that soon in the coming days. Thank you everyone. This was great. If there's anything, join our channel, say hi, and please ask your questions. Over to you, sir. Hi. Uh, thank you so much, Karan. Yes, hi. Thank you so much, Karan. It was an interesting session. Uh, we have been receiving a lot of queries, even what, like on WhatsApp, I'm getting some messages. So I'll forward that to you. And uh, nice. we look forward to meeting everybody again next Wednesday. 
and we'll keep you posted with all the events that are happening the 10th may event as well and if you have any queries you can reach out to me you have my email id or, or you can reach out to karan directly thank you thank you everyone